Right now, we're in Greek waters, and we're sitting in a hot spot. The captain says the Greek Coast Guard has turned into the Welcome to Europe Rescue Brigade. Welcome to Europe. Four years after the wave of illegal immigrants changed the policies and politics of Europe, a looming crisis you probably haven't heard about. You've got right now, give or take, 850 domestic terrorism cases. After a string of attacks in the U.S. this summer, an exclusive interview with the FBI's head of counterterrorism about the growing threat. A 30 to 40 percent increase in those racially motivated violent extremists who support the notion of, of white supremacy. They're called the Big Four, hot tech companies that are the biggest in the U.S. There are calls in Congress to break them up. But that's an uphill fight. Things that harm consumers, things that harm our elections, <laughs> lobbyist dollars and campaign spending will have an influence. New tech and their old techniques to buy influence. We follow the money. Welcome to Full Measure. While the U.S. grapples with illegal immigration, there's an uncanny parallel debate going on in Europe. European countries that opened their arms to a flood of mostly Muslim migrants in 2015 quickly found themselves overwhelmed. Today, much of Europe has pulled in the welcome mat, but the refugees are still coming. And that's left a growing number stuck in the first place they land, Greece, where the immigration minister told me they're nearing the breaking point. Today's cover story is The Greek Burden. We begin on the Greek island of Lesbos. As night falls, I'm boarding a Greek Coast Guard ship for an overnight expedition. <laughs> Right now, we're in Greek waters, but back there where those lights are, that's Turkey. At its closest point, it's just a couple of miles away from Greece, and we're sitting in a hot spot for picking up refugees. How many immigrants would you estimate you've picked up? Thousands. Thousands? The smuggling pipeline is so well established and predictable, the captain tells me they know exactly where to go and when. More or less we have 100, 150 people per night. Tonight you think we'll have yeah. 150 people? Yes, every night. The last three weeks is like that. The captain says the Greek Coast Guard has all but abandoned its job of border protection and has turned into the Welcome to Europe Rescue Brigade. And sure enough, Stop them, around 3 in the morning, we spot a raft. Welcome to Europe. This is Helene Coast Guard. This is Helene Coast Guard for your safety. Stop your engine. Look, go to this side. Easy, easy. Easy. There are more children and babies than either men or women. More than 50 people stuffed in a raft made from 9 to 12. The new arrivals are from Afghanistan, where the U.S. is in its 18th year of fighting a war against Islamic extremists. Despite more than $135 billion in American tax money spent to rebuild Afghanistan, many, like these people, with the means to pay the criminal human smugglers, are still fleeing. This woman tells me she paid smugglers to leave Afghanistan months ago. What did you do between then and now? We are just in home and nothing. We are doing nothing because there was, there is a lot of bomb blasting and killing people. Did you pay somebody? Yeah, yeah. To arrange the trip? Yeah. What did they tell you they could do for you? Nothing. He said that uh, you are going and uh, nothing. For the raft trip alone, they're said to pay smugglers $2,000 for each adult, $1,500 for each child. 
one overstuffed raft can bring criminal traffickers up to $140,000 on the black market, whether it sinks or not. Days before we arrived, one raft went down and 12 refugees drowned. The flood started in 2015 when more than a million people crossed the Aegean Sea to Greece in order to reach Central and Northern Europe. More came through other routes. Now Europe's once warm welcome has been replaced with an icy, we'd like to help, but we're full. So these refugees we just picked up and 75,000 others are stuck in Greece where they first touched down. And Greece, suffering its own economic crisis, is stuck with them. The problem, as you understand, is that everybody that comes to Greece stays in Greece, mostly, 90%. Dimitris Vitsis was Greece's immigration minister when the refugees we picked up arrived in Greece. He tells me they are proud that Greece has helped so many, but now much of Europe has stopped accepting those seeking asylum, leaving Greece holding the bag. The first thing I need is uh, to have a, a common policy about the asylum, to share the burden of uh, the um, uh, refugee issue. This is section A, one of the minor sections, minors above 14 years old. And Greece is running out of space. Once ashore, the refugees we picked up were brought to this camp on the island of Lesbos. The camp has grown so big, it's now the second largest city on Lesbos. There are 5,300 people living here. We have section B also for minors. And, this. and 968 employees working to give them free food, clothes, health care, school, housing, Wi-Fi, and cash payments. The equivalent of about $400 per month per family, tax-free. The result, resentment in Greece's Orthodox Christian culture where there aren't enough jobs for their own citizens. Lesbos was a tourist hotspot before it was an immigration hotspot, but no more. There is only one word I can use to describe the situation. Chaos. Chaos. This local Greek worker on Lesbos told me business has dried up because of the refugees. The refugees continue to disrespect us. Their behavior is just unacceptable. We have suffered a great deal. This establishment has been attacked five times. The last time, they smashed the front door, took the cash register. After some months here, many are sent from the island to camps on the Greek mainland. We have uh, 13 tents here. 860 live at this one outside of Athens. Where are you from? I'm from Afghanistan. 26-year-old Gazelle was a teacher in Afghanistan. She says she and her husband paid smugglers more than $22,000 for passage to Greece through Turkey. Kabul. Kabul. They've been here for 18 months. Going to another country is, um, is a problem, so I want to stay here and find a good job for me and for my husband, and I want to uh, a good future for my child. Many speak of wanting to go to other European destinations. Where do you want to go? I want to go to Germany. They don't realize that Germany has quietly closed the door to refugees and is ramping up deportations. German Chancellor Angela Merkel opened the borders to one million asylum seekers in 2015. That came with a $6.6 .6 billion price tag that year alone. There was a backlash after refugees launched multiple attacks in Germany. An Afghan refugee injured five in an axe attack on a German train. A Syrian refugee suicide bombing injured 15 outside a German music festival. Another Syrian refugee stabbed to death a woman and injured five. And a Tunisian refugee killed 12 by plowing a truck into a German Christmas market, all in 2016. Greece has filled up 26 camps on the mainland, more on the islands. These are pictures of just a few. 
and the country is putting up 30,000 people in rented apartments and hotels. One rescue worker described Greece as a storage facility for the rest of Europe. The immigration minister says Greece is quickly reaching its breaking point. If we pass the 100,000 people in Greece, it will be a problematic uh, situation. When do you think you'll get to 100,000 without help? Uh, without help, uh, the first month of 2020. Back on our rescue mission, we spot a second raft. This is Europe. We are here to save you. Stop the motor. Stop the boat. At first, they try to outrun us, afraid that we're a Turkish ship that will take them back to Turkey. Welcome to Greece. This is Europe. Welcome to Greece. Please stop your engine for your safety. The refugees who are already aboard call out and tell them it's safe. <laughs> They're brought aboard the Greek Coast Guard ship 618. And like thousands before them, they'll be sent to Greece's overwhelmed refugee camps indefinitely. In less than three months following our visit, the population of immigrants in Lesvos nearly doubled, dramatically adding to the overcrowding in the camp there. Ahead on full measure, targeting terror on U.S. soil, the head of FBI counterterrorism tells Scott Thuman how the fight has changed and about the challenges ahead. It was reported that the mass shooter in Odessa, Texas, called an FBI tip line just before his rampage. The FBI says he was rambling. The FBI has taken a lot of flack in recent years for allegedly missing red flags before terrorist attacks on U.S. soil such as Islamic extremist bombings at the Boston Marathon in New York and shootings in San Bernardino, California and at an Orlando nightclub. Now with an uptick in racially motivated domestic terrorism, the FBI's head of counterterrorism, Mike McGarrity, spoke about the challenges and some successes in an exclusive interview with Scott Thuman. More people affiliated with Al-Qaeda now than, than in years past, absolutely. What's that from? That's just, uh, they've been quiet. I think most people think they're back here. We, are, we have not taken our eyes off the target. As a career FBI agent, Mike McGarrity doesn't do many interviews. This is his first on-camera conversation since he took over as head of the FBI's counterterrorism division more than a year and a half ago. How much of a threat does ISIS still pose? I still think ISIS is the same threat it is today in the United States. As the physical caliphate has shrunk, it's like a balloon. You, you push it here, it's going to expand somewhere else. Those foreign fighters have to go somewhere, thousands of them. What was, here's the ideology, come to the physical caliphate, come over here and fight with us, is now go conduct an attack where you are. International terror groups are just one part of the FBI's work. The threat of domestic attacks is growing like the shooting targeting Hispanics by a suspected white supremacist in El Paso, Texas last month that killed 22. And another one in Dayton, Ohio that left nine dead by a man who reportedly supported the far-left Antifa or anti-fascist movement. You've got right now, give or take, 850 domestic terrorism cases. Approximately. A 30 to 40 percent rise since October. A 30 to 40 percent increase in those racially motivated violent extremists who support the notion of, of white supremacy. That we've seen the increase from October through May of this year. Are you seeing more anti-government cases? We have seen, uh, just like we've seen on the racially motivated violent extremists, we have seen an increase in anti-government cases as well. Like that of Coast Guard Lieutenant Chris Hessen who the FBI arrested for allegedly stockpiling weapons with plans to kill prominent politicians in Washington, D.C. You've said that the flash to bang time has gotten shorter. What do you mean by that? The radicalization can still take quite, quite a bit of time, but the mobilization of violence, what used to take years, now literally takes months. I'm talking in a matter of a couple of weeks, and then mobilize to violence quickly, again in a couple of weeks. So we've opened cases and made arrests on international terrorism and domestic terrorism cases, all within a few week period. When it comes to the current laws, uh, right now no domestic terrorism statute on the books, and I think that would surprise a lot of people. 
is it easier or harder for you to pursue a domestic terrorist versus an international one? There's certainly more tools in the toolbox for an international terrorism subject for us to look at. If you were to compare it to domestic terrorism, many of those subjects we arrest on non-federal terrorism charges. So we will use whatever charge we have available. We want to stop the threat. So if it means we're going to use a fraud charge, a gun charge, a weapons charge, an immigration charge, whatever it is, we're going to use those charges to take that person off before they attack. Does Congress need to give you more power? I, I don't think it's appropriate for me, Mike McGarity, to tell you what Congress should do. I think Congress understands the threat, and I know they're working with the Department of Justice. Senator Dick Durbin, in a recent hearing, asked if the FBI wasn't tough enough on white nationalist crimes under this current administration. I can tell you what the cases and the arrest numbers and what the men and women of the FBI are doing every day. When we look at terrorism, we don't differentiate between international terrorism and domestic terrorism. When that threat and when that case comes in, we work it hard. After an attack, people typically say, well, look at the postings from this suspect. How did they not know? How did they not go after him ahead of time? Well, the American people, I'm pretty sure, don't want us trolling the Internet looking at their social postings. People can hate, people can have an ideology, but when they're looking to conduct violence against the American people or subpopulation of the American people, that's where we are interested and that's where we will investigate and put our resources against those threats. That's part of the free speech challenge, though, for you, isn't it? It is a challenge. There have been plenty of wins, too. Like back in 2018, when Cesar Sayak Jr. mailed explosive devices to prominent Democrats. The FBI led the manhunt, eventually identifying, then tracking him down within a week. And more recently, nabbing Connor Climo, a Las Vegas man allegedly assembling a bomb and about to attack Jews and members of the LGBTQ community. The FBI gets a lot of criticism these days. Do you think it gets the credit it deserves? Can we always do better? Do we make mistakes? We do. But in the counterterrorism division, we have a zero failure model. What keeps you up at night? Uh, the lone offender that we know, right, that we are looking at, who has the capacity to a weapon or multiple weapons and has an intent to conduct an attack. And we have those cases and we actively work them, but those are the ones, I feel comfortable the ones, I, let me put it this way, they keep me up at night, but I also know we have a very good team at what we do. So what can they really do to address the threat? We've been following it closely. As you know, my brother is a field agent in the FBI. They're probably going to get some help from Congress right now. There are bipartisan proposals on the Hill to make, formally make, domestic terrorism a federal crime. That would allow agents to more aggressively pursue suspects before an attack and possibly give harsher sentences. Really great interview. Thanks, Scott. Coming up on Full Measure, tech giants rule the web, but their influence goes far beyond your screen. Four major tech companies run the web-based world, but the reach of Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple goes far beyond your browser. And as they face new scrutiny about privacy, antitrust, and data security, they've poured cash and lobbyists into Washington to protect their interests. Lisa Fletcher follows the money. From shopping to socializing and searching, big tech is all over our small screens. But there's a much wider picture in play. Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook are facing a powerful threat to how they do business. The Department of Justice is pressing an antitrust review of the tech giants, scrutiny similar to and that brought about the breakup of oil companies a century ago or the Bell system in the 80s. So. The new tech is resorting to an age-old tactic, flooding Washington with money and lobbyists. They need to spend money in politics so that when those lobbyists show up, uh, politicians remember that one of the reasons they're in office is because of the campaign dollars that the Big Four gave. Lisa Gilbert tracks spending with the watchdog group Public Citizen. More than a third of their political spending of the $346 million that Public Citizen looked at, more than a third has occurred in just the last year. What's the explanation for that? As we've seen things like the Russian hacking scandal that was perpetrated through Facebook, um, or data breaches through uh, tech companies left and right, uh, they have recognized that uh, they're likely to face privacy regulations and potential antitrust violations. All of that means they need more people here talking about their company's best interests. 
Lobbying by the big four skyrocketed more than 600 percent in nine years, from just 7.5 million in 2009 to 55.4 million in 2018, with money going to both Democrats and Republicans. Your report indicated that about half of the members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, receive money from at least two, and in some cases all four, of the big four. Are these companies essentially inoculating themselves against onerous legislation? Yes, it's a strategy to be bipartisan that is unusual, actually, in corporate political spending. So we often see the dollars that come from the biggest companies go towards Republicans. But in this case, uh, Silicon Valley is playing differently. Uh, they've recognized that uh, this legislation is probably inevitable, and so they need people in every room on both sides of the aisle who are on their side. Is it working? Well, uh, certainly we've seen legislation slow down. In 2009, there were 89 lobbyists working for the Big Four on Capitol Hill. Last year, they were up to 277. They have been hiring folks with deep Rolodexes connected to the committees of jurisdiction, energy and commerce, and judiciary, as well as people from the agencies, from the FTC and DOJ, to have on the payroll in-house as lobbyists. Should we be concerned about the high political spending of the Big Four in Washington? Absolutely. Things that harm consumers, things that harm our elections, uh, real, vibrant concerns for America. And the regulation that needs to ensue is vital. So anything that derails the new possible public protections is a problem. Those antitrust probes are ongoing. Gilbert told us it's up to regulators like the Federal Trade Commission, tasked with looking objectively into vital consumer issues. We're back with a look at what's ahead next week on Full Measure. Next week on Full Measure, an international uproar against politics as usual. It can be left wing, it can be right wing, it can be religious, it can be secular nationalist. Uh, there are many different types of populism. Populism for me is just essentially about being anti-elitist and to some extent against the system. Uh, so I don't think it implies right or left. The growing impact of populism on the next Full Measure. Thanks for watching. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. We leave you with a few more scenes from our trip to Greece.